Have you ever read a book about making something? You know, a recipe for making, baking a cake. I have no culinary skills, but one time I saw a recipe for sugar cookies. And I decided, I announced to my wife and her grandmother who was then living with us in her 90s, I'm gonna bake cookies today. And they went, yeah, sure. And they mocked me. You know, in the last days, there'll be mockers. And they were mocking me, but I followed the exact recipe. And when those babies were coming out of that oven and that smell was there, they changed their tune and said, could we have some? And I went, no, you can't, you mocked me. But we all ended up sharing those cookies because I followed the recipe. But sermons don't come that way, do they? When you have to teach, when you have to present a message to a congregation, traveling even her, harder to an to a audience of strangers or your own group, your own church, your own congregation. How do you make a sermon? How do you create something that will be a blessing? Well, are there any rules for it? Well, I was told a long time ago, and it's true, you have to find your own way because a great definition of preaching is truth coming through personality. So it is something unique to me and someone else preaches a different way. You can't copy someone. You can't copycat preaching. Oh, that's death. That's death. So, um, but how can you? How can you preach? How do you get a sermon? Well, it's got to start with the Word of God, right? In our last episode, we talked about Paul's admonition to Timothy, preach the word, preach the word. Not opinions, not what folks want to hear, not I'm okay, you're okay, but preach the word. So as you read the Bible, which we have to live in, your heart starts to maybe beat or you feel some drawing of the spirit to a certain truth. Maybe this is a sermon. That's the way it happens with me. And it can come reading a sermon from someone else and a verse is quoted or reading a commentary or just hearing a song, a gospel song. It can come many ways, but something draws our heart to it. And the first thing you have to check on is, is this truth, what I'm reading, is it from me? Or is it for me to develop for another group of people? A lot of us make mistakes on that. We preach what God is making real to us, but it might not be the thing that the people need. You have to meet people where they are. And if you're a pastor, a shepherd, a Bible teacher of some experience, sometimes God has to deal with us. So he brings something out from the word which strikes us and we get convicted or we get encouraged or whatever. We don't automatically should be thinking, oh no, I gotta make a sermon out of that. It might be just for us. But other things are not only for us, God seems to give us a sense of peace about it, like, no, work on that, develop that, meditate on that, pray about that, because I want to speak to my people through that passage, through you. So that's the first thing we have to find out. Is the truth for us only, or is it for the folks? Now remember, you have to meet people where they are. You have to meet people where they are. Remember what Paul says in one place, I couldn't give meat to you, I had to give you milk. Why? You weren't ready for meat. You know, I had some T-bone steaks. <laughs> you weren't ready for that. You meet people where they are. You can't take the attitude, well, bless God, if they, they, they ought to be able to get this. No, you meet, you're gentle. You have to meet people where they are to help them. If they're in the second grade, why are you giving them uh, a calculus? They're in the second grade. Bring them to the third. Meet them where they are. That's why parables were used by Jesus, to meet people where they're at. So now we're developing this sermon, we're working on it. I've made so many mistakes on these things. I wanna share what I've learned from God's word and from my own experience, if it, if it will help you. Um, 
I've learned like three important questions as I'm developing the sermon wherever it might be coming from. And my late friend Warren Wiersbe, well-known Bible expositor, he was the one that we used to discuss this and he said some, I think, really important things. So I've developed into my vocabulary this way. What's the point? When you get ready to preach or teach, I don't care if it's for 10 minutes or for 45 minutes, what's the point? How can you in a sentence or two capsulate and, and summarize what you want to bring to the people? What is the point of what you're saying? Now on that matter, I would like to say that most preachers, most of us, have too many points in the message, and they're different. They're, they're touching on different matters, and that weakens the main point we want to make. Listen, Charles Finney, the evangelist, said, people can't feel deeply about several things at once. You can only feel deeply about one or one and a half things at once. So a guy can preach, and the more points he makes, he's dissipating the, the spiritual uh, oomph that, that, that the main truth is giving. Now it's dissipating because he's bringing in where angels where come from and the Lord is coming in, but nobody knows the hour. But without love, everything's worth nothing. But what was the point of the message? So whenever you hear a minister say, my, my 11th point, close it up. It's, it's not going to work. With all the learning disabilities that people have, with all the stuff going on in their lives, you've got to get to a main point or point and a half. Build it up from di several different ways. But be able, we should be able to, in a sentence or two, give the point of the message. Number two, who cares? You've got your point, but who cares? I know that you might and I might be interested in the history of the Amorites. And you've read about it, and it's fascinating to you, like the old Amorites, right? Or, um, you know, uh, where did Cain get his wife? Or, or some of the, the mysterious symbolism in the book of Revelation. Okay, who cares? People are fighting the devil. They're fighting discouragement. They're being tempted. They got a wayward child. Some are having suicidal thoughts. They're beat down by life. They might lose their job. They got financial struggles. They're ready, to, they're ready to be tempted to think, where's God in the midst of all my trouble? Why would they care about the Amorites or the hobby horses that some of us get on? So that's a good thought. Not only what is the point, who cares? Does it matter to people? My goodness, you know, Finney's thought about preaching is, is, is a pretty good one. Walk among the people, live among them, talk to them, love on them, find out where they're being tempted, where they're deceived, the wrong things they believe. Then lock yourself away out in the woods for Finney and with a Bible and say, God, give me something to help the people. How can a doctor give a prescription unless he knows from testing what the disease is? So you can't just scatter shot, talk about most everything. What's the point and who cares? Lastly, where's Jesus in all of this? You know, we are Christians, you know, Christians. We're not Moses. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Where and how does this sermon end up on Jesus? Because I'll debate with anyone how Paul, James, John, Peter would ever preach a sermon that wasn't about Jesus. No, 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 never. I know, I'm, but I'm doing a series on the life of Jonah. That's great. Do a series if you feel so led. But get to Jesus, please, because Jonah's not going to help anyone, anyone. Paul never writes about Jonah in any lengthy way. We got to get to Jesus. The Old Testament points to his coming. The, the epistles turn, look back to what he did on the cross. The new covenant, the Holy Spirit, that he's coming again. These are the things that have to be the substance of our sermons. He is the image of the invisible God. Don't try to describe God from Old Testament passages. Look at Jesus. He's the exact representation of the invisible God. Glorify Jesus in your sermon. 
Let's glorify Jesus in our messages. Let's not talk about our church. It doesn't matter. Don't, don't talk about um, uh, your, your own prowess or my prowess of what our accomplishments are. Let's get it to Jesus and keep the people there. He's the only one that can help them. And when you pray, uh, preach about Jesus, I've learned this. The Holy Spirit comes to really help us. Remember what Jesus said in John 16, I believe it is, when he comes, the Spirit, he will glorify me. I have learned that if I glorify myself and subtle ways, you can use that mic to draw attention to yourself. We all know that. Or glorify my church. You know the Brooklyn Tabernacle like it's the bomb. You know, there's other churches, but nothing quite like ours. Or your brand, or, or your denomination, or your five-point Calvinism, or your Pentecostal distinctive. Whatever it might be. You draw attention to that, and the Holy Spirit will not help you. But if you preach Jesus, Jesus, the Holy Spirit will come. You know, he steps aside if it's about me. But when we lift up Jesus, he'll help you and I in ways we can't even imagine. So come on, let's start today in a new way, in the Word of God. Make something real so I can feed the people, Lord, and let it be to the point. Let it help somebody. And most of all, let it end on the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.